How do financial advisors actually get paid? I want to go over a couple things here because uh, it works mostly like what I'm going to show you, but then for other financial advisors, insurance agents in particular, we'll share with you some of that as well. So we're going to start with investments and then we'll go to insurance products and then we'll go to uh, uh, just by the paid by the hour kind of thing. So, which is very, unfortunately, very small group of financial advisors. So. I think it's important to understand how financial advisors get paid because no one works for free. All right, so a couple things. I'm going to share with you a story. Man, when I was a broker back in Shenandoah Valley in Harrisonburg, man, I'd travel far and wide to see somebody at their home. Uh, and and the, you're not doing that because you're not getting paid. You're not doing that out of the good of your heart. But I mean, I remember driving to West Virginia in the middle of hunting season, uh, going up. And so we're in the Shenandoah Valley, which is the western part of Virginia. Literally, I can't remember the road, but uh, if you go it'll be west, like five miles, you're going up a mountain and you're going into West Virginia. It's beautiful country, Franklin, West Virginia, Morristown, West Virginia, Sugar Grove, West Virginia, beautiful country. But man, I, mean, I just remember going up there and seeing people and you know, essentially you know, double wides and whatnot because you're desperate and you, you know you got to get paid. And you go where the people are. Now, I'd sit on the phone, man. I'd be banging on 100 calls a day, 100 calls a day, just picking up the phone. Hello? And that's what, even with the do not call list. You just say, hey, you know, I'm in the area. I was wondering if you know you want to talk about investments. And, you know, very, very few people would say yes, but some would. And, uh, and the problem with that, of course, is now I'm in the, on the road driving to these places wherever they would be. I mean, it'd be in the West Virginia. It could be down in Augusta County in Waynesboro. It could be up in... Uh, the town of Shenandoah, I mean, I was going all the way up to uh, Winchester. I mean, I was driving all over the place. If you wanted to talk business, I was there to talk business. And the point about that wasn't to talk business. It was to talk business and hopefully close a deal because I got paid on those deals closing. I mean, I'd set up a table outside of, you know, when they do like these uh, elementary school, middle school things. I'd, go, I'd call these PTAs. I say, look, I want to set up a table to talk about 529 plans, college savings plans. Can I set up a table? And uh, I, I mean, I was, just, I was everywhere, everywhere. Anyone who would talk, I was there. And that's, and it, look, that, that's good, but it takes a long time to build up a client base uh, when you're doing that. And I mean, I mean, it took a long time. And even after what I was doing that for five years, even after five years, when the market started collapsing in 2007, it was it was just going to be. I mean, I was it was doomsday scenario for me. No other way around that. I had raised about 25 million in assets, which is a lot of money. But come 2007, uh, the ending of towards 2007, going to 2008, just watching the markets go, my 20 million went to 20 or 25 million went to 20, went to 18, and at that point, I just you're not making any money, not enough to keep. Uh, to put food on the table. And I was, it was like, you know, at that point, you, you better find something else because you're going to be in a world of hurt shortly. Uh, it's too bad, but that's the nature of the beast. So uh, one thing with financial advisors, if they are coming to your home, all right, if they are coming to your home, they're coming to your home not to talk financial planning with you, but to get to sell something to you. I just, there's no business where someone's going to actually wait, leave their house with their kids and their loved ones to go to your house in the middle of the night and talk financial planning without a pretty significant paycheck that's coming. No one's going to do that. I'm just, who would do that? The only person that would do that is someone who's got a big sale to make. And, and I know attorneys do this sometimes. I certainly know insurance people do it. And I know financial advisors do it as well. They're doing it because they want to make a sale. I mean, it's no different than a window guy coming out to give you a quote on windows. I mean, these guys are coming out because they're hoping to make a sale. Nothing wrong with that. But you, as a client, got to know, uh, why is he coming out here to see me? He's not coming out because he wants to see what my rugs look like. He's coming out because he's hoping to sell something. So you always got to recognize that. So if some guy is saying, hey, I'll come out to your home, I would think twice about that. In fact, one of the guys I follow, Nick Murray, says, no, you shouldn't go to, I mean, he, I'm paraphrasing him, but he said they should come to your office. That's where you are in control that's where you show the dignity of them taking the time to come to your office as opposed to you taking the time to go to them, especially if you're not sure they're going to be clients because your time is valuable. And I remember that. I remember driving up in West Virginia. I had you know take a day and take a day. So what I tried to do is try to line up two or three people I could see, a 10, 2, and 5 typically or something like that. And then I'd do a seminar at night. That was, that was a goal. It didn't ne never worked out like that. So that was the goal was 10, 2, and 5 and do a seminar at night at 8 at a VFW hall or American Legion hall or something like that. 
Um, but still, either way, that whole day now is gone. I'm not making prospecting calls in terms of calling 100 people a day. I'm literally just taking the whole day to drive, do all this stuff, and drive back. I mean, it's, it's time consuming. So just keep that in mind, that if someone's coming to your home, sitting in your kitchen, they're doing it for a reason. Again, I don't fault anybody for this equation. But don't think that there's nothing that these guys are they're, they're not getting paid in a decent amount of money. So I remember going up there, I was doing a, uh, I think it was Morristown, or maybe was, I came out of Morristown, but I was doing a, a, it was Franklin actually, I was doing a seminar in Franklin, West Virginia at American Legion Hall. I think I had like 10 people. No, it wasn't American Legion Hall, it was a restaurant. Yeah, it was a, a relatively well known restaurant. And I think I had like 10 people coming out or something like that. And you know, I was like, look, if I can get 10 people to listen to me, I'm there. Uh, and so I, I was doing a seminar and I remember we're done with it and I got a couple of leads, you know, leads are just say, yeah, I'd like to talk to you. Uh, it, was, it was tough business. Well, anyway, so I'm driving home and I, uh, and I took a wrong and I, this is, uh, I th- I, either I didn't have GPS or because we're up in the mountains, my, my, uh, my service wasn't working. I can't remember. But anyway, I got lost. And this is the middle of hunting season up in the mountains of West Virginia. I think it's 33 might have been the road, uh, Route 33. I can't remember. And I was, I had no idea where I was. It was, uh, man, it was scary because I'm like, I, and I'm running low on gas too. I'm like, I was down to like a quarter tank, maybe even less. Oh, man. It was like one o'clock in the morning. If memory serves, I think it might even start snowing. I know it's dark. I know it's just lonely. And I had no, man, my Jeep, my uh, phone wasn't working because I had no uh, service, you know, no, uh, uh, no bars or whatever. Oh, man. I just remember thinking, if I break down the side of the road, you know, who knows if some guy's out here hunting deer or whatever it was. I mean, I don't know. I'm just thinking, I mean, it was in, in the Shadow Valley when hunting season comes along, people don't go to school. They're going out there. It's funny, man. It's actually a, a cultural thing, which I love. I think it's fantastic. You always know when there's hunting season because there's few, there's about half the class is there. Uh, <laughs> so it's cool. All right, so with that said, that was how desperate that I was as a financial advisor and your guy is as a financial advisor. Keep that in the back of your mind. All right, so let's go on how some of these work. Um, You got Class A, Class C, AUM. And so what we're going to talk about for a broker, a guy who works like Edward Jones, I get this question a lot, or even Raymond James, they can sell you a product and make a commission. If they can do that, they inherently cannot call themselves fiduciaries. All right, so that... Frankly, that term fiduciary means nothing to me. So don't get too caught up in that. And everyone says, well, he's, not, he's selling you a product. He has incentive to sell your product. Yeah, everybody's got an incentive to sell your product, even if they're a fiduciary. I, I just, ugh. so um, anyway, so, but remember, if they are fiduciaries, inherently, at least they're not supposed to be able to sell you a commission-based product. So if they're fiduciaries, that is what is supposed to happen. They have to serve as your best interest uh, do, do, I mean, they literally take your, theoretically, take your side of the table for everything, which means they can't sell you a commission-based product. Now, some might argue that's not 100% true. It is pretty much true. The fiduciaries out there sell you assets uh, under management fee, and I'll talk about that in a second. But a broker, Edward Jones, Raymond James, uh, you know, Leg Mason, I mean, it's not Leg Mason anymore, Merrill Lynch, those guys are selling commission-based products or fee-based products. But either way, if they cannot explicitly call themselves a fiduciary, they're gonna sell you a commission-based product. And I don't have a problem with that, none, as long as they disclose. So I'm looking at, this is American funds share classes, all right? You got class A, and what happens is, let's say you have $100,000 to invest, and you say, hey, American funds guy, I wanna invest $100,000, or not, hey, American funds guy, hey, Ed Jones guy, Raymond James guy, I wanna invest 100,000 bucks. Well, you know, if it's less than $250,000, your commission is going to be 3.5%. That's what you'll pay. So $100,000 would cost $3,500 right up front. So your advisor will get paid $3,500. We know that to be true. So what happens is, and this is the problem with selling front A or what's called front end sales charges, a class A, is that you get your first statement and it's always much lower than the investment you made. Uh, because you they t- literally take three thousand five hundred out right out of the gate. So you have a hundred thousand bucks. Now it's only worth ninety six five, and you're like, I'm telling you, I've had that happen a couple times. Like, dude, I I never it never occurred to me to prepare people that the commission will come out right the first, and uh, and it's going to look bad initially because you lose three thousand six or three thousand five hundred bucks. And, and the justification with that is, yeah, but now the fees are lower going forward. I'll talk about that in just a second. So here you got 3.5% on $100,000. That's a class A. So you're going to say, okay, I'm losing 3500 bucks. 
Going forward, there's what's called a 12B1 fee, which means it's 25 basis points on top of the mutual fund expense. So the American funds, their typical expense is about 0.5. All right, that's what their typical mutual fund expense is, about 0.5%. Can you see that? Eh, not really. So let's do this. We'll say 0.5. Can you see that? Yeah, okay. So 0.5% is typically what it'd be. So we have $100,000. We put it in a class A share at 3.5, so we lose 96, or we lose 3,500. So we're down to 96,500. And then from then on, we're paying 0.5 plus the 12B1 fee. So we're paying 0.75% all told. So 96,500 times 0.75% is gonna cost us about $725 a year from then on. And that's your all in fee plus 12B1 equals 0.75 percent so your all-in fee at that point is roughly about 725 dollars each and every year now that's going to as it grows you'll pay a little bit more as it shrinks you'll pay a little bit less but that's what we know you're going to pay 725 dollars a year oh, i tell you what, let me write this down here i'll be do it better uh 725 dollars a year so let's give an example here actually let me do this you got a hundred thousand bucks <laughs> 3,500 commission plus 750 a year, roughly. So that's gonna be uh, your total all-in fee uh, will be about 4,200 a year in the first year, and then 750 every year thereafter. You see that, does that make sense? All right, so you're paying a lot in the front end, then you're paying not that much in the back end. Now what happens a lot, unfortunately, is a lot of people, when they're not supposed to do this, let me get my PVC pipe, is they'll say, ah, a lot of brokers uh, will say, well, let's put you, uh, 25, uh, 20, 20,000 here in fund American funds, 20,000 in Oppenheimer, 20,000 Putnam, 20,000 in Van Eck, and 20,000 in Hartford, or something like that. And so then you're paying not 3.5, you're paying 5.75 on five different fund companies. And that's, you're not supposed to do that. And I, the, I it just look, I'm not saying Edward Jones does that, I'm not saying Raymond James does that. But they, it does happen without question. And it's just not supposed to do that because you're going to end up paying that case five thousand seven hundred fifty dollars when he could have just paid three thousand five hundred bucks so that's that's bad and that's kind of what one of the issues about the industry that says oh we don't do that we have no incentive to sell you something to maximize our revenue thus a fiduciary makes sense because we're here for your best interest not for ours and that's not supposed to happen and if that were to happen that guy needs to run out of the business because everybody knows what's going on there his compliance guy needs to say why did you put mrs jones in four or five different fund companies when American funds would have resolved everything because they got enough funds. It's, it's, I don't want to say it's illegal because he's not going to jail, but it's basically, for compliance, it's basically the equivalent of illegal. And that's bad. Now, what happens, though, is a lot of people are trying to what's called annuitize their book. That means they want to say, look, you know, this front-end commission is great. I get 3500 on the front end, but after that, I'm not really making much money. I'm only making... For me, I'm only making, well, I'm, not, I'm not even making 750, that's what it's costing you, but for me as an advisor, I'm only making 250 bucks a year, that's it. That's it, I'm, this is your fee, but for you as a client, uh, that's your fee, 750 bucks, you're paying 0.5% to the mutual fund company, but because there's a 12B1 fee, you're paying 0.25 to the advisor to what's called service your account. It's like basically a small incentive for the advisor to at least call you once a year. So for you, it costs 750 bucks on total, but for the advisor, he's only making 250 bucks, and that's gonna not be enough to pay the bills. So what a lot of advisors will say is, man, I like the idea of a front-end commission, but man, I, I And so they're gonna annuitize their book, and these are, again, are brokers from a broker-dealer, not a fiduciary. Uh, and they're gonna say, okay, well, forget that. Let's put everyone in Class C shares. And I'm a fan of Class C shares. So what happens here is you pay 1%, and that's to be $1,000. All right, that's what you're going to pay on top of the 0.5%. So you're going to pay 1% plus that uh, mutual fund expense ratio of 0.5. So it's going to cost you 1500 bucks a year for what you, it's going to cost you, 1500 bucks a year, because $1,000 to the advisor, 500 bucks to the mutual fund firm. All right? So that equals 1500 but the advisor is getting $1,000 a year. <laughs> so over the course of 10 years, the advisor makes 1,000 times 10, he'll make $10,000, where here the advisor is only gonna make uh, 2,500 total plus 3,500, 
you know, 6,700 bucks or so. So in this case, the Class C share is much more profitable for the advisor if he can stay in business long enough. If he, and this is what my issue was, I was trying to annuitize my book, charge fees, because I wasn't a big fan on the front end commissions, because we're all told front end commissions are bad. So I said, okay, I'll charge 1% a year, is ingrained in the portfolio, and I'll do that for 10 years. All right. And so basically what I'm saying is for every hundred thousand dollars, I'll get a hundred, I'll get a thousand dollars of income for the next 10 years. Does that make sense? Now the nice thing about class C and what I like class C is after 10 years, they convert to class A. All right. And that means the only thing you're paying here is this right here. So they go down from one point, they're paying one percent plus the mutual fund fee. All right, so they're paying at that for the 10 years, for 10. And then they're going after 10 years, they're just going all down to this right here. They're paying 0.75. So your fees reduced by half. It's a, it's a significant difference too, because ideally too, after 10 years, your money has grown. So I always loved the Class C. I thought the Class C were fairest because the advisor got a decent amount of money over the 10 years in order to service your account, keep you active, keep you staying the course. You know, so he can call you and all that to make sure that you're still uh, talking to him. But then it reduce the fee a half, basically, uh, once 10 years came out. But I thought Class C's were wonderful, without question. I thought it was the best thing for the advisor and the best thing for the client. But uh, what happened was that's still not considered fiduciary. It's still considered a sales uh, pitch. And on top of that, after one year... Um, what would happen is there'd be no more surrender charge. There's a one year surrender charge on these guys. If you'd sell it within one year of buying it, you're gonna lose 1% as a sales charge. So what happens is a lot of advisors will say after one year, they'll say, well, that class isn't doing so well. Let's do this other class C and they'll switch you out. And that way you never get the 10 years that you've been in there. And I, that's, again, that's another version of churning. If you've got American Funds Investment Company of America, Class C, and you've been in it for three years, you no longer have a surrender charge if you get out of it. So some guy says, ah, screw that. Let's put you over this Hartford Fund. It's done better. And now you're in a Class C Hartford Fund. For you, you you're not out anything. You literally are not out anything other than maybe if, uh, if you have to pay taxes on the capital gains because it's not an IRA. But for the advisor, they get that 1% front end, that thousand bucks. And they're getting another 10 years out of it over because it's a C share. They can stretch it out for 10 years. It's, that happens, I'm not going to say a lot, but it certainly happens in the industry. But for people who do it right, um, class. Now, look, I'll tell you, the Lenazzo advisor, every time you had to do a switch, it's called a mutual fund switch. Every time you're doing a switch, you had to justify your switch to your compliance. I think lately they've been, well, not lately, I, began, I don't know, it's been a long time, but as I was leaving that side of the business, uh, the mutual fund switches reports are getting more and more stringent, i.e., why are you moving a guy from point it from American funds to Hartford? You have to justify it pretty thoroughly. And I think they've cracked down on that quite a bit. So that's good. You had to do a mutual fund switch report because they're trying to identify advisors who are churning. So I'm a fan of Class C. I'm much a bigger a fan of Class C than I am of this model for the most part. Um, this model is a fiduciary model, all right? So you're saying at the end of the day, I'm a fiduciary, I don't charge commissions, I charge a percentage of assets under management. So in here, I usually charge, uh, uh, for one million, I usually charge 1%. So we got 100,000 bucks, just say. That means I'm charging $1,000. But what I've seen many times on Sunday is that you also have mutual fund fees in there that are like 1% as well. So in that case, it's not just $1,000, is one thousand dollars plus one thousand dollars? All right, two. So you're paying one percent for the mutual fund fee and one percent to the the manager, uh, the advisor, who may or may not be a fiduciary. And this is what American funds, not American funds. Ed Jones is doing, and other firms too. El Raymond James. I've seen this in my own portfolios a million times a Sunday. Uh, people would email me that they're paying one percent fee, but then they have a bunch of mutual funds in there that also have a one percent fee. Fidelity funds. American funds, Hartford and whatnot. So now you're paying 2%. That's not good. I mean, that's 2,000 bucks a year that you're paying. You do that over 10 years, that's $20,000. By far and away, this is the most expensive proposition there is. Without, I mean, it's not even debatable. I and mean, that's, you can't, you shouldn't be doing that. So the question, but they don't disclose this other fee. They just disclose the 1% that they're charging, but they don't disclose the other fund fees that they have which is ridiculous. So now what a lot of advisors, the fiduciary advisors to avoid that, cause they, they recognize that, you know, hey, eh, it's probably not so good that we're charging 2% and we're only showing 1%. So what they'll do is 
A lot of these guys will charge maybe one and a half percent on the first five hundred thousand dollars, and then maybe one point two five up to a million, something like that. So they're going to reduce the expenses on the mutual funds. They're going to use ETFs, which will just say 0.1 percent, but then they're going to charge you one point five. All right, so you're still paying one point six, and that's still one thousand six hundred dollars you're paying on the uh, on the on the assets of of a hundred thousand bucks. So again. More in line with a Class C, but unlike a Class C, this never goes away. This never drops. A Class C, you know, after 10 years, it will drop. And it's just odd how the fiduciary, and this would be a fiduciary model, part and parcel, without question. But it's just odd how the fiduciaries never talk about how the Class C fees drop after 10 years uh, by those evil salespeople, whereas their fees never do. In fact, as you get, the only way it drops is as your account grows, you might have less of, a, of an asset fee that you pay. So that's, you know, that's not, I don't like that at all. So if I have my preference, I'm taking this, Class C, because you're gonna get your advisor, he'll get paid a little bit uh, over time, and then after 10 years, after, you know, hopefully the guy's still in business, it will automatically convert to an A share, reduce your fees by half, and then you'd never have to look back. I mean, it'd be crazy to get rid of an A share. Uh, that you, I mean, I, I, if you have an A share, it's crazy to get rid of it simply because you've already paid the fee I and mean, you've already paid the commission, all right? So in this case, that's how that works for financial advisors on the broker side. Now, I want to share with you though how it works for insurance guys with like annuities and stuff and why, uh, <sighs> why the annuities guy gets a bad rap. And there's a lot of, leg I just click, you know, I just clicked that, you know, I keep doing that, my big old feet, my big old boats is my life, wife likes to call them. So the reason annuity guys get bad raps and life insurance guys is because they get paid a lot on the front end. But because they get paid a lot on the front end and not much on the back, they're always hunting for new pieces of business. And that means they're not really doing a great job servicing their client base. Oops, I just nicked the, the thing too. And that's, that can be frustrating. So let me give you, going back to an example of an annuity. A lot of annuities will pay 4% commission so a hundred thousand bucks be a four percent and these are not fiduciaries again and again i don't get too caught up in the fiduciary non-fiduciary but you got a hundred thousand bucks and it'll pay a four percent commission so it's cost you four thousand dollars and that's not cost you that's what the advisor is getting paid so they have a huge incentive to say let's buy this annuity uh, they get 4%. Sometimes, uh, well, not sometimes, every single annuity I've seen 